seems that it would make sense to start at the beginning, right? Uh, with um, uh, this painting, which is really, I think, the first completed uh, work of the, of the library series. Uh, in fact, we were looking at uh, including a different work, which was uh, number two. And finally, when I realized, well, look, we're, we're, this is an exhibition that starts really at the beginning of this narrative, which is 15 years of, of Shausa's uh, uh, remarkable output, both in terms of the number of accomplished works that he has made, but the number of series and ideas that he has uh, dealt with, at which point I said, we need to put number one in. We need to start not almost at the beginning, uh, but uh, you know, so this work maybe is the uh, so it's the benchmark and the catalyst for the for the work. And I don't have too much to say about it outside of um, that. Um, it when we look closely at it, 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 it you can see things in it that you see manifested in uh, kind of ever expanding scale and and accomplishment in the other works. It's an accomplished painting. It is deliberately quite abstract. But this beginning of, of making, uh, first making images uh, of straight on of, of, the, of uh, cropping uh, books, books or, or print uh, items. And second, doing things that have to do with kind of blurring the imagery, uh, which is something that, that Chauza uh, does. Uh, so really, as, a, um, you know, as, as, as an exhibition, I, I see this group, these uh, three works, and this as kind of the, you know, really the, 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 uh, the formative stages for all of the other works. Um, and uh, this, this painting, and I will refer uh, to the catalog, so I encourage you to when you're thinking about this later. Um, which is the one gold series, but it's gold number 10. And one thing that you will find is it can be very hard to, uh, Chaus's work will be uh, challenging for you to remember the names of. And that's okay, because oftentimes it's June 2nd, 2001, FWT. And then there's another one that's almost the same. I mean, they're very deliberately kind of hermetic, you know, by that. They don't tell you much, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how they give you little bits of information later. This, this work, what, um, after really looking at his work a lot, and I hadn't seen this, this painting until the exhibition, um, and for me, I think this is a terrific location for it. Even though it's not you know, the first painting, it's kind of an ant's eye view, isn't it? I mean, this, this is not a large painting, but that book feels huge, right? It has that uh, almost painted from the perspective if you could be an ant on the, on the surface uh, uh, that the book is, is on. And in a way, for me, that, that's, uh, that embodies kind of an essence of ideas that uh, are important to uh, Chaucer's work. And that is uh, kind of the monumentalizing, the, the, the pedestalizing, the, the significance of, of, of the book and what uh, what it means in terms of knowledge and history and culture. Uh, so this is, I think this is a really effective place for this, you know, for that reason. It's, it kind of it really summarizes all, all of that. Um, <clears throat> but I was mentioning downstairs, and we'll move around and, and see this more. Um, this, this work from a little distance uh, does become somewhat photographic. But I think as you're uh, uh, closer, you will see it is, it is a, a very painterly painting. I mean, there are uh, all of the, uh, the, the, the highlights, the, the lighter uh, kind of cream colors are not just uh, shapes that you can see the hand, the brush stroke, but you can see the physical thickness of the paint on them. So uh, unlike in reproduction, the, I mean, the works are very much about painting and painting painterly language and, and reminding you, the viewer, that they are, well, they're, they're handmade. They're not trying to fool you into thinking that you're looking at a photograph, except it's not very much about painting. 
So the first few, I mean, this is a little bit uh, out of kilter, right? I mean, there's some pages that seem as if something, uh, something's perhaps not right about this, this book, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's not pristine. It looks a little beat up. Maybe that's simply used. I mean, that's, that's a good thing, right? I mean, that's what we would wish for in, in, in uh, books, uh, our, our vessels of knowledge. But I think as we move uh, through and look at uh, other works from the early series, the library, the Chinese library series, I think what begins to more and more catch uh, Charles's eye uh, and the, the, the focus is the, the kind of uh, almost rotting, the, the disrepair of the books, the way they're, they're you know, in such uh, a poor shape. When this, this painting is quite different than all, all others in the exhibition. What, what is it, uh, what's the first thing that um, when you look at it you, you think of as a distinguishing yeah, it's the most, it's probably the most abstract, right? You said you don't know what it is. And there's something else that both distinguishes it, but that tells us something about his practice. To me, it feels like it should be on its side, with, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. so much of his other, the layers are yep. on their side. So. It, it breaks that, that horizontality right. that, for me, almost uh, makes some of the works in a kind of secondary or tertiary level, have a reference to landscape, perhaps. Uh, but it's, it's that it has a incredibly shallow depth of field, mm -hmm. right? If you've taken photographs before, mm -hmm. there is only one place that feels as if it's in focus, right? And then the rest becomes that, that which is closer. I mean, my, my understanding is we're, we're seeing a, a book perhaps at an angle such as this, so the part that is nearer, which is larger, uh, is out of focus, and the part that is further away than the very shallow depth of field is out of focus. And uh, so for me, there, there are a few things that, that make this painting informative uh, to, to Schaus's work. Uh, it's a very overt, uh, not, I'm trying to think of a better word. It's very, it's overtly telling you about his practice. Uh, you, you may look at the others and wonder, did he make a preliminary drawing first? Did he make a number of drawings and then create the painting from the drawings? Uh, which he does not. He really works, works from uh, photos, but gets lost. I mean, totally, they, tra they tr become transformed into paintings. But this one, he's really telling you that he, he uses the camera, right? I mean, you don't get the depth of feel. You, you can't have that experience with your eye. You know, you can't squint. And, I mean, if, if you saw a book like this, it would all be in focus. There's no way that you can do that without using that technology. So for me, it's kind of a, um, kind of clues the viewer into his practice, right? Uh, and then secondly, for all that is so masterfully painted about some of the other uh, paintings that we will, we will look at in the books, the, the subject, uh, the books that are stacked here in the, in the Museum Library series, oftentimes I think some of the most beautiful passages are the ambiguous spaces that are around the books. And without those, I think that combination is the combination of those two things that that give the paintings power and this painting is an early painting of Shauza really kind of getting lost in the parts that are not about information in the this looks like a book language but about painterly abstraction right uh, so they're, they're, this is I think one of the more beautiful parts of this painting, and it's kind of a blob, right? I mean, it, it isn't, oh, that's a book page. It's not, it's not about being something in a representational language. It's really about getting lost in the painting process. So to me, that's important too. He, he may take,
photographs. These are photographs he's taken by visiting archives and libraries and use them as the source, but it's not replication. It's using it as the framework to create a work that so totally becomes about painting and painting process. And that's what I, I feel this really is a really indicator of. Does that make sense? So, <clears throat> so you will find in the uh, catalog something that may be useful is uh, I think virtually every work in the exhibition is reproduced, but we've included uh, a handful or two of additional key works that are not in the exhibition that may be interesting uh, for comparison. Uh, so this is uh, Chinese Library number one from 2005. And do you see some of the, the properties in this that, that, we, that we see in this? But you see, uh, but more, more subtle, right? I mean, this, this here, it, it, it feels as if both there's a light source that's focused, but also uh, the depth of field is, is uh, not as exaggerated as this painting, but, but it's still happening, isn't it? I mean, this, this area uh, becomes kind of out of focus, uh, becomes less about, about information that describes this image as a book, and much more about, about the painterly act of composing a, a picture, composing an image. Uh, but in those other parts that we see clearly um, in a way that's kind of different from this, which is, again, I think more about telling us about his use of photography in his painting practice and, uh, and then uh, really introducing abstraction. In a, in a, in the vast, vast majority of this, besides maybe this much, is an abstract painting, isn't it? And, and this part that's in focus, because we can't understand the rest of it, I mean, if we saw this not in this exhibition, I, I bet that we would be hard pressed to say, I bet that's a book. Yeah. You know? I, uh, in fact, I got a typewriter when I first looked at it. So uh -huh. now, you know, the keys are yeah, yeah. in focus. And... I mean, it could actually be something that the image was deliberately blurred, that it was something that was clear, but it was deliberately blurred. So, I mean, this one really to me is much more about introducing abstract language and painting to his work, which no matter how highly rep representational passages of his paintings are, is important and, and remains important in all the work. But this one, it's becoming a bit more, more specific about the subject of book and its state of disrepair. And that may be meaningful in ways that we could have touched upon downstairs. Um, um, I think we can uh, safely say that um, books and what they contain and the, the meaning and the history uh, and scholarship are, are important uh, to show so. Uh, there's another, yeah, and I think that's, that's, I guess I'll leave it at that. And the works that are from the Chinese libraries, these are, uh, these are images of books the way he found them there, okay? So he went to the back room of a library and saw this book and took this photograph. So it's not it's not a um, it's not a setup. It's not someone did something to the book to look this way, or it's not the book didn't look like this. But I'm going to make it look as if it's in bad shape to make a statement. It it really is the way that it looked. Okay. And I think that's that's key. And at some point, um, at some point after we get through this series, there's a change that we'll talk about in, in his work. Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious whether the painting here and the one here it seems like there's a distinct architectural quality to the way the books are stacked. Is that intentional on Shouts' part? You know, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, he, he he was trained as an architect, and I think that um, no matter how I don't know that. In any of them, it's it's an overt uh, decision on his part, but he he knows structure, and I think that uh, uh, when you think about it, the pa the paintings have a well a well constructed element to them, 
and that some of them do have an architectonic feel to them, don't they? And I think part of that, and we talked about it in the, the first one that uh, Stephen mentioned, by, by painting it in a way that has a feeling of an ant's eye view, it makes it monumental feeling to the viewer, and, and it does feel a bit like a, like a high rise or, or, or something, because you feel so small, it doesn't feel like a book, it feels like something else that's constructed large. So, um, yes? Would you speak a little bit about the color? Hmm. Oh, that looks like there's, it looks like there are red undertones. That's a, you know, that's a great question. And he has, by this point, started to do that in ways that are much more overt in later works. But Shauza oftentimes paints a very warm uh, underpainting layer. And uh, this, this is a, it does interesting things to uh, everything that you paint on top of it. Um, as we know, in painting, uh, a white ground, which is what uh, is common for, for, for making paintings, uh, that is then painted on top with uh, various layers of color paint, still effectively functions as a way for light to reflect back at you, the viewer, when we light it. And the white ground helps that happen. If you paint a, a warm, in this case, a kind of an orange, orange, red ground, and then paint everything over it, the reflected light that kind of bounces back at you, the viewer, uh, when looking at the canvas, is unified by, by a kind of warmth. So all, all, all the paint that he puts on top of that ground will have a, a warmer uh, a chro chromatic, uh, a warmer color to it, and it will be unified also. I mean, they'll all be related because they're all whatever colors he uses, plus unified by sharing that, that warmth. And this, this is, you know, this painting, he does this as well, and one of the things that, uh, unless someone has acquired one of uh, Shouse's painting and chosen to frame it, he, he tends to leave the edges, leave the evidence of the painting, the act of painting, showing. So you will see bleeding and drips, and oftentimes the part that you will see the most, and you can see it on this painting, um, are the drips of the underpainting. And um, if you think about it, it would make sense that it would be the underpainting, right? Because the... It covers everything. Well, it covers everything, but it's also making this image was not a, you know, kind of slap the paint on kind of, kind of uh, exercise. And the underpainting uh, is the one step that Shauza, besides the gesso, does, usually does on the floor. So he'll lay the painting on the floor and get a big brush, you know, and paint, paint it on. And paint it on without the level of, of care that, of course, is required to create the image that ultimately the painting becomes. So it's very unlikely that the kind of masterful painting that is what you see would lead to slops and drips off, off the side of the, the oil, right? Um, so here you get, uh, you, you get kind of the, the blue um, just on the one side. So, and it is kind of fascinating. It is, it is a way that a lot, it's a practice that a lot of contemporary artists uh, uh, use, and that is to, to not be concerned about the signs. Just, you know, whatever it is, let it show. Um, so for how, how masterful, I mean, this painting, I think we can agree is, I mean, it's a really uh, beautifully painted painting. Um, so it makes this have a sort of fascinating contrast to that, doesn't it? <clears throat> so this painting, for me, uh, I'm going to double check the number, I'm virtually certain, yes. So this is Chinese, uh, library number one from 2005, the, the smaller painting we were just looking at. And the one on the right is Chinese library painting number 41 from 2007. So, and it, and they are, I mean, and there are four, there are 39 between them. And so he didn't make that many paintings. It's not kind of arbitrary. And uh, uh, besides thinking this was a terrific painting and should be in the exhibition, it also tells us a few other things that I think as, as docents may be useful for you in describing his work. 
uh, it, it reminds the viewer about how productive he is as an artist. This is just one series, and he's he by 2007 had made 41 of this series. And the other is that <clears throat> the series, which if you look closely at the catalog, uh, you will see, for example, well, I'll get to this uh, this this particular page. The names of the artworks are in dark print. So it tells us, it says Chinese Library number one, and then it says opposite, Chinese Library number 41, but above it in a slightly grayed out text, it says Chinese Library series, and then in brackets, 1995 through, and the through is open, okay? So one of the things that is interesting, and I think uh, our, our colleagues at the KMA uh, would, would have some insight into is to install his exhibition creates certain challenges because with each series, new series that Shaoza begins, he, he doesn't end the last one. So this one began in 1990, 93? 95, I think. But he, he, he reserves the right to keep making more, and in this case, he has. By four years ago, he was on number 41. And the other series, uh, Western Books, started in 1993, but he's still working on uh, the Museum Library series, which are these. It didn't start until 2005, but he's, he's, it's still open. It's a series. So every time he begins a new series, he doesn't close another. He has simply added another series to explore. And if you are the exhibition curator to install the exhibition, if you installed it by the date that the art was made, by chronology, you would kind of shuffle up the series because there's a lot of paintings in this exhibition that were painted between that date and this date. But on the other hand, it makes a heck of a lot more sense, I think for the viewer, to see these next to one another and disregard chronology. Although sometimes we use it. So it ends up requiring kind of informed decisions to really think about what's going on in his work and what conceptually makes sense. And I say that as we switch to the Museum Library series because this is one of the most recent series. Uh, it didn't start until 2005. However, conceptually, it's very strongly related to the other series and, and in terms of uh, content. So how, how is it that, what do these have it's pretty obvious, I think, but what, what do these have in common with everything else we've looked at so far? What's the subject? Books. Yeah, it's books. And, and we'll get to this later with the, some of the other works, it's books that he has taken the photograph of. So these are photographs that he's taken while visiting libraries and archives and looked at books the way they were when he went in. And, and taken fairly straight ahead photographs of them, um, which is also fascinating to me because in someone else's hands, that could make really boring paintings, don't you think? Yeah. Let's say you went to a library, you took a photograph of a book, and you went back and you made this painting, right? So it's really fascinating because it, it's a very, very focused uh, artistic practice, this series. But as we look, and now this is much later, what else, what's different about these paintings than the, the first ones we looked at? Scale. Uh, over the years, I think Chauza has increased the scale and, and created, I mean, not always, and not all works needed, but they've become more and more ambitious. Uh, and perhaps it's uh, as, as his, his uh, masterful, his technical prowess increased, he continued to increase the scale of his works. So, the They're books are more and realistic. Too. And museum yes. books seems to be much more cared for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I feel as if these both have they they don't feel the uh, decades of neglect that you you sort of sense from from these books which this really does almost feel like 
you could be looking at a geological sedimentary layers as much as a book, uh, as a side of a book. These yes. two books, however, for me, and and knowing that now he has an architectural background, yes. these remind me of <clears throat> the apartment buildings in China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this, can see you, I know you've seen this, the laundry hanging outside. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. go from one city, you have experienced that, yes. and this reminds me. I mean, what more do you see in the building than you see all of those, those certain windows, designs, uh -huh. and the uh -huh. lines? Yep. And these remind me of those huge apartment buildings yep. that they have. And some are very run down, they look yep. very bad. And I, I see mm -hmm. these, this here especially, on the top of nearly all the big buildings, right, they have some kind of a pagoda. Yes. Yeah, usually in the center. And but, these uh, yeah. curl, uh, yeah, they're mm -hmm. more, they're smaller yeah, yeah. than the, but well, those uh, remind me of buildings. Well, one, one. Uh, and he had to have seen that himself. Well, you know. With it, an architect's eye. But sometimes, <laughs> you know, uh, surprisingly, uh, yeah. an artist may do something yeah. and the thing well, they learn from somebody else that, yeah. oh, I never thought about that, but it, it could actually be, uh, a, subconsciously, as a, uh, a Chinese artist, as a Chinese artist who spends much of his time in the U.S., uh, Shaozi does have a studio in, in uh, uh, the outskirts of Beijing as well. But he, he you know, he, he spends much of his time in the U.S. Um, you can't get away from who you are culturally, and there may be uh, embedded in your work on a tertiary, tertiary level things that exist that you may or may not have, have been conscious of. Um, that's, that may not have happened or somebody who is not part of the culture that uh, the book is from, that the artist is from, would have, would have done. You know? uh, the, these, these books feel, feel a bit lonely and forlorn to me, but not as if they're uh, rotting. What's that? They're sparse. They're very sparse. Nothing next to it. Yes. Uh, particularly, you know, overabundant like that. Mm -hmm. Better care for. Yeah, much better care for. They're, they're still used. Yes. They still show evidence of use. Yep. And you remember mm -hmm. we were t talking about uh, in the painting with the really shallow depth of field, how there are actually very large, the vast majority of that painting is really primarily abstract and ambiguous uh, space, right? Uh, th this, we, we can all agree that this is um, very highly representational, isn't it? Uh, although I, I'd invite you to come close for as much as the way the, the, the black uh, books feel like leather or like a leather-like uh, surface. We, totally understand that from where you are. I would also invite you to come close to get to the point where you really do see each brush stroke and lose that hyper real uh, quality and start to see it really as a painterly object. But even so, the vast majority of this painting it is the ambiguous space around it, isn't it? Uh, so, I mean, the, the whole part of the abstract, you know, the abstraction and painterliness is very important to Chaozi's work. It really sort of sets the stage for this to, to be as, uh, to, to be read as, as highly representational as you may see it, right? Uh, and then, if we consider some of um, your thoughts on uh, uh books, and even make them more general, that uh, the books can't help but, in some way, uh, reference uh, Chinese culture, the place that the books came from. Where Where is this from? I mean, can, can we get, I mean, uh, when I look at this, I can't help but see modernism, right? Uh, so, uh, there, there are, I mean, I think very, well thought out ideas about how Shao's have framed the work in ways that make sense for the subject uh, of the work that, that he eventually paints, right? And uh, I have a, uh, a quote, uh, uh, or kind of some notes that uh, 
um, I wanted to read to you to think about his work, which is uh, uh, see his combination of, of extraordinary uh, accomplishment at painting photographic imagery representationally, but also his inventiveness at transforming the kind of modest and ambiguous information that a photograph may provide. This, this whole background, uh, you know, together is, is in part, I think, what makes these works so masterful. And also, if you look at this, can you think of another artist who paints the kind of acrid green beige of institutional shelves with a few books under the pall of fluorescence and then makes a painting that, oh, that's beautiful. And I'd love to look at that. I mean, that's kind of remarkable when you think about it. I mean, who goes out of their way to find institutional shelves and fluorescent surrounding as the, the starting point for their subject? So it is something to, to consider. I think for students, it's a great thing to consider. Uh, if someone is an is aspiring artist, would you look at the narrow focus of the subject up to this point that Shaoza has focused on for his work? If someone were to say, oh, I don't have any ideas. There's nothing around that I can look at to make artwork out of. You know, well, I mean, here's somebody who, uh, I mean, so far, we have a book, a book, and a few others, a book, parts of three books, so far, you know? Uh, but obviously, there's so much more going on than the subject. That's what so those are all a book? That, that to me, with the 141, 142. Oh, you're right. I think this is a, a stack of related books, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and I, and I get the feeling over here that there's a stack of books there. I, I think you're. You, I think you're right, and I think it's it's essentially a, the way the way a volume of information right. is is bound uh, 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 there. It seems to me that the depth of field yes. has a lot to do with, for my vision, mm -hmm. is these are common. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. I stated that, but I am still wondering if that has a lot to do with it. With, with the depth? With the depth? Uh, I find it Oh, uh, well, it, it, it could be. Um, it, it does certainly, I, I think, as, a, as the subject that the, the artist is using to paint from, uh, by, by working with a fairly narrow depth of field, which we've, we've seen, he, he's told us that he does yeah. in this painting, um, it does uh, help make that photographic image that he begins his painting from have this ambiguous space in the background and a, dis and a really distinct area that is focused. They're very frontal, right? I mean, there's really a, a plane here that is in focus. And even, even this seems to create different levels of focus. And you know we know that that's, that doesn't. There's not a lot of change in depth, right? Um, <clears throat> these look really uh, terrific together, and I think they represent from the series um, kind of the, the, the range of subjects. One that is almost monochromatic. Uh, the, the right painting that we're looking at. Uh, I mean, really, it's uh, although there are there, there are subtle shifts in, in, in color. I mean, really, it's it's a black and white subject, right? Um, and uh, on the reverse side, uh, the stack of uh, really uh, high value, I mean, high chromatic value paintings as a contrast. Uh, and I think it really looks looks terrific in the museum here because. Having having this to look at kind of makes this more powerful for its for its lack of, of, of colors, you think. And then having this here kind of adds a charge to the color that is in this museum library painting. Um, but for all the ambiguity here, you know, we still see you know, he, he, he chooses to include certain things, almost like the, the that sort of uh, kind of. Uh, the spot welding that institutional shelves have, I mean, that's included. Uh, 
accomplishment, right? Uh, and once in a while, there actually, if you can believe it, there might have been a place where, and it might have been as little as something, you know, something in there didn't, like, it became ambiguous in a way that didn't support the, how this feels and looks like this, this thin, thin book that we see. It may have been on that level, you know, and at that point that uh, we'd have those kinds of conversations. Another yes. question about the color. Do you mm -hmm. think he ever uses uh, in his selections, mm -hmm. you know, framing the, the, the photos or whatever, um, intentionally use color symbolically? I, I don't think. I don't think in 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 these works. No, and I think he's pretty conceptually rigorous in that. Uh, he, he, I know he doesn't change I mean, once in a while. Uh, it's possible that this book wasn't quite as light. So on a scale of one to 10, if we were to see this as two, 
maybe in the in the photograph it was three. I mean, that's the kind of shifts that he might do to make it uh, make it a better painting. I mean, again, he's not a copyist, and he's not trying to show us that he can reproduce that photograph. It's the photograph was the structure, and then throw it out of the way after it, you know, becomes becomes a painting. But I, I think he he. Uh, I don't think there's any any symbolicness to the uh, in terms of cultural issues to the choice, and he didn't change the colors to make them be symbolic. But as we were saying when we we're looking at this, I mean that's MoMA, it's the MoMA Library. It's an incredibly austere, modernist uh, uh, looking painting in many ways, right? I mean there's there's an influence of that subject. Uh, I don't mean that it's not it's not contemporary. But um, when you look at the label and see that it's from the MoMA library, it kind of makes sense. So I mean, clearly there is a decision, but I don't think it's symbolic exactly. You know? um, this is a, another series that uh, Shalza has made many of, and in this exhibition, I think we have just really just the one, but there there is more than one in the uh, in the catalog. No, I guess you no. Know, it's funny. This this the work on the left is considered part of the same series. So this is the the silent flow of daily life, which started in 1998. Okay, so we now have the library series, which started in the early 90s. The Western Library. We have the Chinese Library series. We have the Museum Library series, which started in 2005. We have the Silent Flow of Daily Life, which was the first series that really focused on newspapers. So that's the shift. I mean, up until now, we've been looking at books, right? Still keepers of knowledge or keepers of information, anyway. And uh, <clears throat> I should quickly say, and I think, you know, we've talked about all of the issues I think that are important for the Museum Library series. And the third of this series is, is on this wall. And um, I don't know that there's anything conceptually new to talk about in this painting, but I, I think this is an extraordinarily uh, accomplished painting. I think it's really amazing. And we know who this is, right? Uh, uh, so it's, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, artists often look to art history, you know, look back at uh, four, four subjects, right, and, and consider those who preceded them, and uh, perhaps one way to consider the museum library books is that Shauza has conceptually, by focusing on the book subjects that he has, uh, but when we look at the palette on this, it's, it's quite a bit different than, than here, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I, I think of Durer primarily, you know, through through uh, uh, woodcuts, which are, are black and white. But the period that he painted, I mean, this 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 seems to have the sort of lush feeling of of early Renaissance uh, paintings in terms of the, the chromatic variety. And he certainly had fun and sort of got lost in this. And when you get close, this this looks completely not realistic and completely painterly, which is really interesting because when you get back and when you see this painting reproduced, it, it looks much more photographic than the, the painterliness that we see when we, when we see it in person. <clears throat> Am I correct in assuming that this was later than the Mules? I think, let's see, did the museum, I think that the MoMA libraries were first and then the Met. And uh, they were pr pretty close, but it, but yes. Um, That's what it's supposed to be. Okay. Yeah, it's 06 and 05. So we did them in pretty close uh, succession. Um, we we uh, are closing in on noon. Are we really? So, okay. so we, I don't think we need to. Uh, I mean, the challenge of having something to say about each of the works is is uh, we could be here all day. And I don't know if that's really helpful. These, I think that. Is it? it is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here, okay. What what's different about these? Here he's looking at information in a very different way, which is it's about 
um, the excess of information. These are kind of about the, the repositories of knowledge, the great old tomes that the keeper of cultural information and scholarly thought. These are about, oh my, oh my goodness, you know, after a week we have this many newspapers. What are we going to do? We're overwhelmed with news and information. So formally, there are many, many things in common, but conceptually there's a shift in his interest that, influ that uh, influences the next uh, works. Uh, so I think of these uh, probably more like still lifes, even though you could say that these are, but these are, this, this is a kind of a series that more closely embodies issues of still life, a singular form in space. Uh, but like some of the others, this, and you know, and these are, this is the way the archivist or librarian, you know, after a few weeks of newspapers, they get folded up and put in the shelf. That's how we found them. So he didn't spend time carefully arranging them. This is how they looked, uh, which I think is the thing that's really consistent with the, with the others. Okay? Same here. I mean, here they're stacked. Uh, here they're kind of rolled. And we, this is you know, how we see this kind of you know, uh, material uh, dealt with. Uh, fairly monochromatic, but we have that sort of institutional putty color. There, there's always uh, color in there. We can look on the sides to see if there's any clues about underpainting. This one just has white. You can see some drips. Um, and this one, the underpainting is a dark, dark red uh, kind of maroon. And uh, besides the sort of palette of near white to near black, but in, in a blue, we see the uh, the sort of ubiquitous red that we see in newspapers as the, as the other sort of visual, uh, formal, chromatic uh, change. But, you know, there, there are things that almost, you can get lost if you start to be seduced by the, the beauty of the painting itself, start to think about or, organic, you know, they almost become mountains or sedimentary layers again, which is sort of interesting, that structural uh, element. But we'll, we'll move a little quicker now. This series, these four, are all a part of this series. And uh, these are called fragmentary views. And this is a body of work that Shauza has made many of. And you will see in the catalog that we've included, we probably included four more. Maybe we have eight instead of the four that are in this exhibition. Because this exhibition really focuses on representing key works that uh, show the breadth of Shouse's work, for as many uh, great works in the series that he's created, we only have four. But they represent different ways that he's made these paintings. So, uh, what did we talk about with the, the, the newspapers on the other side that are key, and these? That they're the way they were stacked. This is the way they, they were in the, in the library or archive. So, and in this series, we show many, not all of the ways that he does this, but he'll, he'll look at a series of newspapers and take a cropped image of them. And if the archivist tags them, markers on them, puts a label on them, or just stacks them, that's what you see. And this is one um, that we chose for, you know, to, to, to show this added element, which is, I think, quite, quite uh, wonderful. And when I was talking about the title, the challenge, uh, the challenges that come from that. I mean, this painting, it's uh, April 2004, TP. So this one tells us, okay, TP, me, you know, the, the initials are the name of the newspaper. So it's Times Picayune. So when we look at another, maybe not this one, but there may be a clue that you can figure out. PPG is the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, NYT is obvious. So he, he tells us those things, but sort of cryptically. Uh, but what's, what's interesting about these? Well, he, he crops in on just the way they are. And uh, you know, some of what happens, I think, is representative of how we, how we get news. You know, the difference between the stillness and the calmness that we talked about on the books. These, are, these don't feel calm, right? Even though they're also 
set of books, newspapers stacked, but they're really lively and busy, aren't they? And he frames them that way, and the subject, which is this combination of image and text that newspapers are, is that. And then secondly, by, by taking a stack that had been put together, you get a little bit of a slice of what was going on every day over the period of, in this case, it would be one, two, three, four, five, almost a week. So this is a little side view of six days of time represented in this painting. And I think that there is this other element, which is we're kind of bombarded by the media with news today, aren't we? And, and I think that these kind of represent that. Uh, we, we kind of experience the news in bits and pieces and fragments that we then, you know, maybe try to put together to understand the narrative of what's going on in our world in terms of the news. And I think these, these paintings are representative of that. But, you know, this very abstract passage, do you see what we see here? you see that? I mean, there's this huge part of her face. Um, the date, it's April 6 through 10, what was it? Um, TP uh, 2004. So what's confusing, if you look, it's April 2004 TP, but the date he painted it was 2007. So he tells you the date of the newspapers in the title, and he tells you the, you know, the month, the year, and he tells you cryptically in the paper, but he may not have painted it at the same time. And uh, this one, I mean, whether it's uh, something as sort of uh, seemingly not newsworthy as uh, tax assessing information, or uh, we, we see uh, what looks like perhaps uh, part of a portrait of, of uh, perhaps a, uh, someone from the Middle East. We see uh, uh, a, a shot into uh, a church. We get little pieces. You can try to construct the narrative meaning of it, but I don't think he's trying to tell you that this is the story of what happened this week. It's sort of more about the overwhelmingness of news and information and pieces and making really dynamic compositions out of them. Yes? So you don't feel he's making a political statement, it's just the way this happened to be oh, I, No, that, that's not necessarily true, but I, I don't think he's trying to tell you if you read this and then go to that and go to that, it means exactly this. But yeah, I think that the choices that he makes in terms of the focus uh, uh, can absolutely be uh, uh, about either uh, or maybe interest in what's going on and maybe a little ambiguity about the statement. But the many paintings that he made during the lead up to the Afghanistan and Iraq wars can't help but have focused on that because that's what was on the front of the news. But he chose to, to make those paintings from those photographs and that was very important to him. So it told the news, but that was the news. And uh, the other thing that's uh, different than these, these he took the photograph, and the only kind of photographic imagery is the photo that he took as a basis. These, the subject is full of photographic images, right? So he's taking a photo of things that have photos. And from this point on, much of his work has to do with that. And and ask, another way to look at it is this, this is this is the news, but current events are mediated by news media. So this is the this is the mediated news and in pieces. And that's kind of how we how we get the news. You know, that would be the lens I would say is, is interesting to, to look through. And you know, obviously we would have a much harder time fully comprehending the details of uh, the the the, the Fragmentary views that focuses on a Chinese newspaper, uh, but uh, Shaozi makes uh, many such works, and I think this is a particularly beautiful one. And in a funny way, uh, because we cannot understand, uh, at least I can't. Anyone here? Show of hands. The text it kind of gives us a, an opportunity to to look at it kind of through a more formal compositional lens. We don't really know what's going on, but. Uh, I mean, the way it's easy to see without being distracted by being able to read this, how masterful he, he paints the characters and in the curve, you know, how the paper folds under and the physical feeling of 
of uh, dimension that he captures. And uh, we'll, we'll keep looking at these. So uh, Chazza did a, a whole series that are closer to this palette. Uh, I mean, a whole group out of this series. And um, there are two reproduced in the catalog that are quite similar to one another. Um, this is March, and they both have exactly the same name. They're both March to April 2003 LT. You know, just to have that added confusion. But that was the, that was the subject. He chose not to change the name because that's the way he names them, and that's, you know, that was, uh, they both were that, that month. Uh, so here, there are some differences than these two. The Chinese newspaper, which is, I think, representative of this Chinese newspaper, has far more text and far fewer images, right? And it's uh, black and white. This later painting, he's backed up a little bit and has chosen to include more text. So he doesn't change the grouping, but he can decide how close or how far and exactly what he's framing, right? And this one is close enough, and the papers were so full of images, uh, having the images tell the story, uh, that there is very little text that's uh, in, in it, is there? And the only clue one has is March to April 2003, LT. So. It really, uh, after some looking, it asked the viewer to consider what, what was going on during those months. Um, and you can then, you know, kind of confirm perhaps your assumptions about what you're seeing. So March, March 2003 was when, and I quote uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, when I say this, is when shock and awe happened, right? So. Um, that's what these fragments of images then represent, right? And uh, what do we see? I mean, are these people holding weapons? Are they people trying to get food because they, they no longer have access to food? Is it uh, the injured? We don't really know because that's all that you see, right? You, 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 you know a certain amount and that is, that's, that's when it was from and these are images in that newspaper that of tell us something. So past that, this is something that has been common in art uh, for a long time, taking uh, images of things that are actually violent or uh, uh, tragic, but, but are beautiful too. You know, that sort of bizarre paradox of, uh, uh, I mean, he's made a beautiful painting out of a uh, difficult subject, right? Um, January to April 2004, MN. These paintings, uh, these two in particular, but this one especially, uh, I think as, as Schaus has made more and more of uh, the fragmentary views, and just the paintings in general, we can see on the side the drips of the red, really brilliant red underpainting. And more and more, not just the sides, but uh, the way Schauza paints the image, he, he lets more of the underpainting show through. And in a painting such as this, you know, formally, it, it's, a, it's a, a really um, kind of powerful compositional and powerful formal uh, component because this is that red, red, white, and black newspaper, right? So this you know, brilliant red that exists in one of the newspapers, in a little bit in a second, um, he's able to pick up in the underpainting and include formally the glow in the shadows of that red in a way that unify the whole painting and make it not be kind of starkly black and white. But, uh, you know, tough painting, isn't it, uh, in terms of the subject? So. And this one, just uh, we haven't done this on the others, but to give a little uh, insight. So let's read everything we can read on this. You know, what has he chosen to give us in terms of text? 502 on signed an agreement. 
something in something outskirts of the city raged with moments respite for the weary percent of registered enterprises and problems would eventually something rates in the industrial countries by an average of 0 0.5 to 1 percentage points Be become borrowing would not that helpful huh <laughs> uh, but you but it's kind of like the images it's a reminder that you're not really getting the whole story you're getting a slice of something but i do think that you know this is much harder for us to then say, oh, I think I get the gist of what's going on in that passage than this, isn't it? I mean, what, what does this one, I mean, the, these folds of newspapers actually create whole separate passages, don't they? What are we seeing right here? What, do we, what does it look like we're seeing? Very something. Yeah, so because of the timing, we, we do, I think, correctly, Conclude it's a soldier, even though it's a person apparently in a hospital with tubes and we see the metal bars. Um, so we do actually know some things and bring it to our understanding, don't we? Making these into wash paintings, and that he was he was thinking about these issues and seeing what they look like formally, and they really, I think, have come into this other work. I mean, it, it's actually kind of, I think, an early kind of formative work that has, that, that says something about um, uh, Shouse's other interests. And, I mean, let's face it, when you go to China, you can go somewhere and you might walk down the street with you know, 400,000 other people. There's a lot of people there. Huge crowds is cultural, you know? <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I, I would like us to come in here as, um, I think it's really important to uh, spend a few minutes with the installations, uh, which are, I think, extraordinary. I spent all this time talking about why they're important to be here, and, and now we're going to run out of time because we spent too much time talking about the paintings. Uh, but uh, there are two installations in the uh, exhibition, and there, there are a number more reproduced and discussed in the catalog and are, are interesting and worth, worth uh, I think, reading about. The other thing that we just saw in this video, besides the crowds that look like the masses, the crowds of these, are banners, you can see them right now, the little red squares that just seem to be all over in the audience. He doesn't really tell us what, why and what this video is about, but these otherwise seemingly random, abstract, maybe uh, he chose something to represent something through red uh, squares that um, you know, he didn't have to make up. I mean, that's 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 the color of China, you know, the national color, and they're they're in the video around the corner, which is really fascinating. So, two two installations that are fairly early of his here. This is flags and banners. Sorry, could you repeat that because he was just banging when you oh, said... Oh, the name of this? This is, we have two early, <laughs> two early installations. Uh, this is Flags and Banners from uh, 94. Yes. I'm going to put dates right, yes. And uh, Order, which we'll talk about uh, after it. So, you, you've looked at a lot of his work, and I'm going to ask you, you can tell me some things. So, what, 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 what do we see, what do the edges tell us about these paintings? Yes, so, you know, in 94, he made this. This is an installation, but it's an installation that's made up of, of what? Nine paintings and, and a pole. And uh, this use of underpainting, which he again really lets you know by actually formally finishing the edges with red and then letting the image end before the edge of the picture plane um, and then bleed through. And uh, so the, the name of it is Flags and Banners. What, um, what are we seeing? Um, Protests. Yeah, I mean, the full name is uh, A Century of Student Movement in, in China. Uh, so as early as uh, 94, he was uh, looking at you know, taking uh, photographs that, historic photographs, photographs that, that documented over a century uh, basically student movement, student protest, student 
uh, I mean, the opposite of protest. Students, you know, yes, we love this, or no, we're against this, with these elements that sort of tell the story, a story that we can't necessarily access, but whether it's telling ideological information, uh, political uh, uh, leader information, um, very painterly, aren't they? I mean, they're actually, um, he's returned, he sort of returned to being more painterly in some of the later works, similar to how, how his works were, uh, you know, at the very, the, the very beginning of this, 15 years ago. Um, so, and we, we know that he's been looking at um, the holders of knowledge and information, books and newspapers. These are historic photos that he, or, I mean, historic meaning they, they were like important historic photos, but they're, they're photos that documented these things that he, that he used. And what's in them includes elements that are basically the transmitters of, of information, right? Um, so these are even this far away, very much an in interest. We see we see um, things that he does much more later, which is the, the blurring, the blurring of images by painting and then brush stroking over in a way that kind of unifies uh, the forms. And uh, something that's um, I think important to know is, uh, and you may have heard this if you if you were at the talk last night. Um, I wasn't. I was at a layover in Detroit. Uh, not being at the talk. Shaozi um, um, uh, was uh, at Tiananmen Square in 89, which was you know, really a largely student uh, uh, uprising. And um, um, as he would say, he played a very, very minor role, but he was one of many people who was there uh, really trying to uh, organize and, and have something to say against the powers that be. And, really places him in the lineage of the subject that we see here, doesn't it? Um, I think it really is informative in terms of thinking about his work uh, entirely. Uh, so for me, this, this installation and knowing this and knowing his interests is, is powerful for what it tells us, but it's powerful for what it doesn't tell us too. I mean, it's kind of mysterious. It doesn't give us answers, right? We sort of know certain things. I, uh, you know, this, the, the pole. I mean, you know, that's that's what these are. Um, you know, is it is it sort of the one of the marchers set this here? Does it sort of allude to the fact that uh, the artist was has was a part of this and leaned this here? Uh, I mean, kind of, kind of interesting, you know, interesting to think about. Well, I'm, we're, I think we're waiting for the next image to go up there of, of the next yeah. protest, whatever. Could be. It, it could be that it's unfinished, an unfinished story. It could be that the red square uh, represents the, the political powers of, of China. Uh, so the story is being painted over them. I'm not sure that the artist wants there to be a literal, this means that, and I now want you to see it this way. But I think all of these thoughts, I mean, that's what's sort of interesting about this. It could, it could sort of allude to any of those, and that's pretty fascinating. Uh, and then the other, which I think is a beautiful work, uh, and I'm really thrilled is in, in, the, uh, um, in the exhibition from 99, and, and um, so we've seen so often, um, even if books are sort of decaying, the artist obviously has a real love for, for books and newspaper, even though there's sometimes an element of, of cultural critique. So this is about the destruction and the wanton destruction of books. And uh, his, his subject, this is an interior of a library ransacked by the Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution. And that was a time when a, a ton of books and other, uh, other uh, culturally and, and perhaps scholarly significant objects were destroyed in an act of purging from you know, bourgeois and, and past. And uh, so he's uh, painted in quite a painterly way. And, but what form did he choose to make the painting of? Yeah. So, uh, which he hasn't done in any of his other works, has he? 
So he's really used the a, a traditional form and format for uh, art making in China to, to tell this story, hasn't he? Yes? One of the stories he told was yesterday, someone asked him if he remembered about the Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. and he said the one big image he remembers his dad was the director of the school, mm -hmm. and people in the region would deliver the books that were supposed to be destroyed. Yeah. And occasionally, and he was about 10, I think mm -hmm. he said, he would stay in his dad's office, and he would look at the books. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and he realized that he shouldn't get caught doing mm -hmm. that. And some were fascinating in how there were there were maybe a couple of books he would like to have kept, mm -hmm. but realized that he couldn't do it. Right. That definitely he could not do it. That would be dangerous. And just the fact that he looked at the books was dangerous. Right. So that, I mean, as a personal narrative, that's pretty they, important. They'd be stored there before they went to be destroyed. Yes. So he, he has that yeah. push pull that Yes. That should have had his books. I'm sorry. Are these um, you know, it, it's, I've shared what I, and I've talked to Shouse about this, but I'm, I'm, I'm not someone who says, okay, Shouse, what does that mean? Uh, maybe I should, you know, it's funny, because I, it's just not the way I'm here, but I, I started to talk about bigger issues, and, and I've written in that, asked for his thoughts about them, and, and um, you know, in a way, if you look at the, the chaos that was created with the really wanted destruction, it's not just that they were destroyed, they were just sort of, you know, stomped on and made to be a, you know, it looks like, it's like book violence, right, you know? Uh, and then this incredible order that's marching over them, which uh, uh, is, is it, it's so orderly as to, you know, perhaps try to deny them. And, you know, what from, we've seen elsewhere, what, what does, what does red symbolize? He said it's you also know? the little red mouth book. Yeah. The mouth book? Uh, China, political, I mean, that's the color, that's the color of China. So, you know, I mean, I, I can't help but see this as, uh, you know, in a way, if we use the scroll, the scroll may represent Chinese culture and history. He's very deliberately chosen this form. And uh, the, the story that's in it is not a great, it's not a happy story. And this marching over of, you know, powers of it, tramping over it. So, I really think um, I mean, we've talked about every, almost everything. The videos, the other video, uh, I think is very, I think you can just watch it and you'll know what, what it is. It's not something, I mean, it tells a story, it's a video, and you should just take the time to watch it. It's only, I think, 12 minutes long, and it's, it's shot almost immediately after. Uh, it, was, it was actually after 9-11 and before we went to Afghanistan, and if there's anything to think about, it's just that, He's taken a video of people riding the subways in New York, oftentimes holding up the newspaper. Everyone is quiet and not communicating, but they're all kind of tied together by sharing this, you know, every day reading more awful news and bad things. Formally, he's holding up the newspaper. You see image after image, which you see in, in uh, the fragmentary views. And in both sides now, because when light is shining behind it, you see both sides of the uh, newspapers, right? So there are actually many things that you will you will discover in the video that you will realize, oh, that that I saw that in his paintings. That that's what he was doing in that series, and and uh, I think it'll very be self-explanatory. And I think we can understand these without talking in detail about the same things that apply to these in terms of stylistic. Uh, Elements of influence and even wash and, and uh, oils and um, what the you know what the subjects are. They're pretty pretty straightforward. Did you tell us about your man? I you know I did, but I but I, but I did in the context of but there was a reason besides just shame and doing with books from the West and books from China and take, taking taking the books in a very staged uh, photographic like setting and tossing them up in the air and taking photographs of them. Okay? So in terms of, of what what is happening, what he's doing is very straightforward, right? Um, these are these are photographs. So that's what you're seeing. 
but you know, I think what's there are many things conceptually, and this has been the case with so much of his work. Uh, it's like what, what, conceptually, what's what's important here? And um, where are you? There we go. Uh, what are the books? You know, it's Lao Tzu, it's Nietzsche, it's Marx, it's uh, Engels, it's Borges, it's uh, Sartre, it's important thinkers in many different uh, cultures. Uh, and uh, this gesture, if we think about his other work and his interests in sort of um, um, fleeting knowledge, uh, you know, the, the, the rotting of important tomes, I think you, you can kind of think of what, what does this mean? I mean, he's making them really light, um, just flipping them up in the air. I mean, that's the photo that you get. I mean, I'm sure he took more than one to get this, the Sartre being, being and nothing. There's, these are, I think, if, if anyone is uh, particularly interested in philosophy, there's much that one could think about in you know, what, what's, what does this mean? What's the meaning of this act or gesture, the, the choices that he made? What I would uh, invite you to do is, I think each of us talk about these books in the essays, and I know we're, we're really kind of dragging on um, so I might uh, invite you to read, read what uh, Karen and Britta and I wrote and, and come back and think about it. Uh, now, he said something yeah. yesterday, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that it was related to the actual burning of books, the destruction of the knowledge. And that the light he has on it, he said, is reminiscent of the flames mm -hmm. of the fire and, yep. and actually tossing the books mm -hmm. in, in the fire. Yep. So, okay. And that's something that, uh, uh, right, that you can ask, ask the artist, you know, right. uh, because there's a, like much of his work, it can be very precise on one level, but ambiguous in terms of, yeah, but what's the meaning, you know? Um, He has done, I think one of the other installations you'll see reproduced in the catalog is book burning, uh, Nazi book burning. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when he's interested in a subject, it's not, well, now I want to criticize China for doing this. It's really a critique of cultures that do this, you know. He mentioned, he mentioned the, the Kristallnacht on, yes. at, at his noontime. Right. Okay. Oh. And the other thing he mentioned with the other video, and I didn't quite understand was the connection with the date, the June 4th day, is, was that Tiananmen Square? Yeah. It's, it's the 9, it's sort of like the 9-11 there when they yeah. say June 4th yeah. in Chinese. It's, it means yeah. something uh, yeah. quite different. And, and, and that was Tiananmen Square, is that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and the, that video is of people gathering on June 3rd actually for, and, and over the night for a big concert. Almost as if they had forgotten the the June Fourth anniversary that, that had been so important. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? And is I that how you heard it? That. Okay. That's what yeah. he said. Uh, that's yeah. what he said. Yeah. Yeah. And I would imagine yeah. elements of complexity in that, which is that uh, probably you get in uh, big trouble as a large group gathering on the fourth. Right. So you could maybe subvert it by gathering a day earlier. And or under a different, over. Yes. yeah, you know, or under a different guise, or is it forgotten? You know, okay. it's, uh, you can see, uh, so we'll come come back and, and watch this. It's not long, but it's uh, really uh, not only uh, I think a really powerful uh, video. It informs some of the other work, and it and it really brings you right back to that moment. I love the folded paper there yeah. and how it's. Yeah. So reminiscent yes. of his other work, yes. So, yeah, it, it's sort of a reminder by focusing on, I mean, here he's made a video basically about post 9-11, about lead up to war in New York on subways, and he has remained true to his subject. I mean, he almost only focuses on the media, on the newspaper, um, which is really sort of fascinating. So he both can tell an amazing, an amazing range of stories with a very narrow focus, if you will. Um, and he, he stays really true to his interests in the way that he chooses to tell stories. We should put the Jim Campbell piece back up mm -hmm. so, sure. to relate to yeah. the 9-11. Yeah.
So that's, I think that's just about enough. Thank you. Well, I think it's <laughs> wonderful.